who had not rejected the West or Europe, who had known the winds of other lands, and the rest of that sentence I will not complete. All these men, and three amongst them, I too well known to be mentioned, but I think not yet so well known not to be repeated. And I refer here to the educational philosophy, one of a Rabindranath Tagore, the educational philosophy of a Mahatma Gandhi, and the educational philosophy of a Sri Arvindo. As it happens, the seminal date, and I've done some little research, seminal date in which all these three come up is 1909, <laughs> between 1906 and 1909. And Rabindranath Tagore comes out with his system of education. And I don't have to spell this out once again before you in which he is not static at all. He first begins in 1909 with the idea of the Tapovan, and then he proceeds, and then there is a trajectory of his movement from 1909 to 1938, and this is almost my childhood then. <laughs> and I have sat on his lap and I, where? The one seminal thing that comes out, and I have all these quotes, Prabir, for your text of the, in which the one thing that he is stressing right through is that there cannot be a dissociation in the educational process between the cognitive skills, that which belong to the mind, and the manual skills, which belong to the hand. And that is why Sri Niketan and Shanti Niketan were part and parcel of a single vision, and not to be divided into Shanti Niketan, Vishwa Bharti, and the Central University, with Sri Niketan, the Santhals, and all those great terracottas of Birbhum, etc., etc., to be taken out. And that, edu while there was, as we know, a very animated dialogue between Tagore and Gandhi, and that also needs to be seen very, and Sabhisachi Bhattacharya has done a wonderful job of bringing out those letters of where they differed and read, but the, where they came together, and I have the original writings of all these people here, where they came together was in two accounts. One, the use of the mother tongue in the early stages. Two, the use of the hand and the crafts as a pedagogical tool in the entire educational process. That is where they, they differed on many other accounts. And there, this was the most explicit and courageous, as also loving, difference of opinion between these two leaders. And I think that it is and would be an educational experience for those who are going through the orientation course to see what these leaders had to say about the systems of education the purpose of education and the curricula of education, which raises questions for us even today. Gandhiji, on the other hand, as we know, and I sitting in IIC now, am a silent listener at the back of these tremendously highly erudite discussions that take place on Hind Swaraj, we have suddenly and Lately, I've attended only three such seminars in which the socio-political philosophy of Mahatma Gandhi has been brought out. And it has come from the right, and it has come from the left, and it has come from the progressives, and it has come from the, and it has not come so much from the stereotyped Gandhians, may I say. 
And I wondered why, because somewhere, something, there is a ferment and they want to look at it. And so I went back to Hind Swaraj and read the chapter on education very, very carefully. I know my Hind Swaraj. And then I went into the discussions which took place after that and which led then to the Vardha scheme and all that Aryanaika did. And then Zakir Sahib, I skip over those two decades, till Zakir Sahib comes out with that seminal pamphlet, a small thing which I think everyone should also, which is the first enunciation of a curricula on basic education with a third chapter on the use of the crafts in the educational system as a pedagogical methodology. And what does it list? It lists agriculture, it lists naturally the spindle, it lists the wheel, and Kamla Devi spoke about salt. This says bringing out the yarn from the cotton is the educational process of bringing out refinement from the student. So it is essence. One looked for salt, and then he looked for the refinement of the yarn, not just the yarn from 100 counts and 120 counts, but the yarn of yourself from that raw cotton of the self. And it is that which brings me almost to my own. Because the emphasis on basic education, the curricula of basic education, as it was worked out, flowed into independent India, into the citadels of the North Block, into the enunciations of a Maulana Azad, into the establishment of the Zakir Hussain Center of Basic Education in Jamia Millia, into Mujib Saab's, and into that history of its gradual decline into oblivion because we had a problem, not a problem, but choices between modernity and a, another socio-economic order in which the educational philosophy would sit, did not sit. So not by design, but in the process of time, but let me not hark back on that. Let me just take you now to Aravindo. Here is a man who comes back from England, sits for the ICS exam, and at the last moment, just when he's about to go for an interview, he says, no, thank you, I'm not going. I'm not entering here. And it is at that moment, the first thing that Aurobindo does is that great Uttarpara speech in 1906, followed by his pamphlet on the need for a policy of national education. And in that, once again, I have all these quotes here, which I will not keep pure. Read them out, partly time, partly my eyes. What does he say repeatedly? And this is before he becomes Sri Arvindo. He has not yet gone to Pondicherry. It's all that has happened is that he's come from Baroda to Calcutta, and he, what was the incipient Jadavpur University, 
That is the time that I am speaking about. And here Window talks of a system of education which then flowers into what we today know in Auroville or Pondicherry as a system of integral education. But once again, and if you read that book, where does it begin? Integral education, not in terms of super, supramental and everything else that we associate with Sri Aurobindo. He begins with the body. He says a physical body is the first thing. He talks about the refining of the senses and a remarkable chapter on how the senses have to be refined and unless the motor and senses, senses are in balance, nothing else can happen. Then he goes into physical body, then he goes into mental and on and on till he goes into values. In short, this is integral education. So here we have three leaders. And the writing of many of these leaders has naturally been and understandably until yesterday almost critiqued by both the social scientists as also some educationists as this nationalist discourse, the nationalist that we were trying to make a nation when nothing existed. And apart from the political discourse on it. And my submission here is that this was not making an image of India out of nothing, but it was the India that they knew and grasped and an India which we still need to grasp because that dichotomy which was started between the discourse of the Anglicans and the Orientalists continued like that because the institutions and I now come to where we are. Because on the one hand, there were all these institutions that were created, the archaeological survey, the botanical survey, the zoological survey, the anthropological survey, the Asiatic Society, the Indian Museum, the Prince of Wales Museum. These remained on one side. This was to know India. And as one book has said, to know India from afar. And there was the education system, which was the Hunter Commission or Macaulay. The two did not meet, even if they were under one roof. And it was in such a situation that independent India decided and to have its own commissions. And I refer now to the first commission that was set up a little before 1948, and this was the Dr. Radhakrishnan Commission. And Dr. Radhakrishnan Commission's report, I like, and Vivaji is here, she must be very familiar with it, because repeatedly the Radhakrishnan report is talking about that education is nothing if not the inculcation of values. Education is nothing if it is not lifelong. Education is nothing if it does not nurture that intellect which can then take up leadership for both its contemporaries as also the future. This is what Dr. Radhakrishnan says. Followed by yet another report of the Mudal Mudalyar Commission on secondary education followed yet again naturally, and I am one instrument in that, with the Kuthari Commission in 1964. And the Kuthari Commission once again goes back into two aspects. What does it tell us? It recommended two major things, and I'm sorry because 
one has to take responsibility also. One, the establishment of neighborhood schools and the elaboration of that neighborhood schools. And Dr. Kutari was my teacher in Delhi University. What was his? Because the neighborhood schools would be that instrumentality of creating an equity and an equalization of different socioeconomic groups of people. And it recommends that specially in at the village level and in what we call the Mufassal India. And that those neighborhood schools would not make a distinction between what we have today, and I dare not open my mouth with Biva here, between the public schools, what we call the public schools, the government schools, the municipal schools, etc. And today, as we know, there is a, again a debate of what is better, the government schools or the... But the idea of the neighborhood schools was that you would bring in all the community resources into the neighborhood schools. Something which I cried hoarse and did not succeed in the NPE of 1986 with Sri P. V. Nasima Rao. And there is only one line after, I think, hours and hours of argument and we don't understand what she is saying. I mean, Madari wali pata nahi kya kya kaiti rahti hai, hamesha kaiti rahti hai, kush kaan kush kaiti rahti hai. To man ka Madari wali ye kaya rahi hai ki Madari walon ko bhi school mein le ao. Ye kaya rahi hai. Ki ye pata nahi ye kya kaya rahi hai ki sab ko jo khilone bechte hai, usko bhi school mein le ao, jo ye karte hai. Because there is a very clear demarcation in our mental cognitive that while we wanted to be the beneficiaries of the creativity of those socioeconomic disempowered but creative in terms of representing an Indian identity we could not empower them within those systems of education which we ourselves had established. And Laila and Rajiv and all these people who are here as advocates of that sector. I have given all chapter verse of these discussions here. I'll not elaborate on them and why the CCRT was started was precisely because to integrate when there was an NCRT, there was no need for a CCRT. And I know the pain and the travails that one went into before. The advocacy was done and it, was, it didn't happen just one fine morning. Because the resistance an understandable resistance that the moment you brought this in, all that superstructure that we had created of the binary opposites of tradition, of modernity, of literacy, of illiteracy, of the mm, Saab, of the Dhotiwalas, of this, that, and the other would break down. And that breakdown is a threat to our empowered identity. And therefore, when a potter comes here as a teacher, we can use him as a resource person. But teacher? Oh, no, 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 no. Lekin uski jo baad bari bani hoi Manipur ki, Nilma Devi ki, iski, uski, wo hamare drawing room mein zhur reh sakti hai. I can't make this chanderi sari a thing of a curricula, whether at the school level, because it requires a curricula of where does the yarn come from? Who makes it? Why is it made? And who is the maker? And when I suggested to my old university 
last year that why don't we give a doctorate to the great Banaras brocade makers. I got a letter of Laji, you are the B.H.U. of Sanatika, you are the Sanskrit Jan. What do you say? We give them a delay. They gave me a lot of money. 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 Because they will be a lot of money. But we didn't hear this before. And I can give you other instances. Because there is, without elaborating on the whole field of the arts, but for me, this division of the arts and crafts is an artificial division which was made by, an, at that time, of the post-industrial era, which was interrogated by thinkers both in Europe as also, and you should read the writing of A.K. Kumar Swami on this subject. <laughs>